come inside or go away. I think it's important we look at the media we consumed as younger people, as adults, to properly gauge what we should be carrying forward with us and what we should never show to children again. The year was 1994. There was an idea brewing in my mind. I was starting to understand that there were bad things that happened in the world, that a darkness was manifestly revealing itself to me in my young mind. I kept on coming back to the stories that didn't shy away from it. You don't show the darkness, you don't appreciate the light. If it weren't for December, no one would appreciate May. Don Bluth's work, The Secret of Nim, in particular, put a bit of a spell on me as a child. And I know I'm not alone in this. And despite the fact that it scared me silly, I wanted to return to it. Unlike the films like Watership Down, which to this day is a bit of a suffocating experience to watch, The Secret of Nim and other Don Bluth and Gary Goldman films are a part of a grand narrative tradition, which commends to children the existence of darkness. Despite the fact that it didn't have the level of brutality that Ward Down had. It was a brooding, atmospheric film with beautiful animation and darker themes that elaborated on the importance of not ignoring darkness. That it is something not to hide from for the very reason that there is a light that can defeat it. Hold it, hold it! I know we're dead up here, but so's the music. Come on. Eat it up. Honey, you know it. Much has been said about the dark themes and strange storylines in Bluth films, but when I was small, I had such little understanding of what was going on. The story really was secondary to me. But there was something else that made me come back to these films as a child, something that was less tangible to me at the time, something inherent to the atmosphere of Bluth and Goldman's films. It was the relationship between color and music. From the very beginning of the film, the colours make an immense impression in The Secrets of Nim, with strong contrast vignetting the frame with dark tones, alongside the use of expressionistic angles and soft, undefined backgrounds. It creates an evocative atmosphere of unease and dread. Expressionism also explored darker human themes, such as madness, moral ambiguity, and the deconstruction of social norms. For Expressionism especially, the style lent itself to gothic stories such as Dracula, seen in Nosferatu. It's no surprise then, that with these films as a visual reference, Bluth and Goldman establish a disconcerting and melancholic atmosphere. As a child, I always found one element of this film particularly disconcerting. But here again, we see an expressionistic influence. The eyes. According to Richard Williams, Disney animators used to be told that if they were short on time, they should prioritize the eyes of a character. Research also suggests that the eyes reveal a lot about our inner world. Pupil dilation is linked to how uncertain we are about decisions we need to make, and eye movement is related to our moral choices. Whether we know this or not, an effective and common way films make a character mysterious to an audience is by messing around with their eyes. In Nim, the eyes are used to play with characterization. Be it to evoke a sense of mystical fear in the two sages of the piece, Nicodemus and the Great Owl, or to demonstrate the deranged nature of supporting characters. Eyes are often used to disquieting effect. Making characters whose plot function is to support the protagonist more morally indiscernible. Not a very terrifying notion for a child that is used to stories with quite binary moral ideals. Who are you going to trust if you're unsure about the safety and sanity of a mentor, a guide, or a friend? It is interesting to note that this was all part of a larger aim in Bluth and Goldman's work, 
which was recapturing the golden age of Disney animation. You know, that we weren't learning fast enough to replace the old guard. Everything in the, in the studio was union controlled. We couldn't use any of the cameras or anything like that to experiment. So the only way we could experiment was to get outside the reaches of that union, buy our own equipment, and then just feel free to explore. And in exploring, we found out things that we really needed to know, like <laughs> the straw that broke the camel's back with me was in uh, Rescuers, I believe it was, where they didn't even paint the white of the eye and the little mouse anymore. It was just all the same color as the skin. And so I said, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. There is so much that defines Golden Age animation before TV required insatiable turnovers of new animation shorts and cheaper methods. And amidst some of these techniques, there's a particular sense of color. When you compare one of the darkest scenes in the Golden Age, Night on Bald Mountain in Fantasia, with the Bronze Age's Black Cauldron, you can see how particularly contrasting colors are more vividly used in Fantasia. The vivid and often almost monochromatic backgrounds in Nim harken back to the luxurious splashes of color, heightening the drama and intensity of each frame, especially as you can see how aggressive and prominent colors like red alongside harsh, contrasting dark hues are used. But of course, Night on Bald Mountain's influence does not just depend on its animation to produce a sequence that lingers in the mind. It is the music, one of the central parts of Fantasia, that drives the darkness of the scene home. And here again, the secret of Nim shares traits with Golden Era animation in that its score pulses through the story to continue to terrify and disquiet little children. He had told us he was going to do a sweeping score. He says, I'm not going to do some Mickey Mouse thing like they did over at Disney. And as he got into it and he was watching the animation, he called and he says, I don't think I'm going to be doing a sweeping score. He says, you seem to have a rhythm going on and the rhythm changes and stuff in the animation, the way the characters are walking, mm -hmm. the tempos, they're there. I don't want to dismiss those. Those are musical. The combined orchestral and choral efforts of Jerry Goldsmith, for whom this was his first animated film, alongside the classic scoring method of Mickey Mousing, which was corresponding musical cues to actions and characterization, meant that The Secret of Nim had a score both recognizable for an animation, whilst grander than most. Which feels a lot less like this. Or even this. and a lot more like this. This is also particularly effective because it's not overused. Whilst in this scene, the classic comedic tones of the music sets up the introduction to a comic relief character, the point at which we could have some Mickey Mousing, i.e. the hopping of the actual mouse in the shot or the swinging of the bird, the score goes silent. Is everything all right here? The silence then lends itself to build up to a point of tension later on in the scene when a villainous cat comes into play. The silence is also a somewhat disconcerting experience for a child used to musical cues to clarify emotional tone. you were scared. That's not to say there aren't certain moments where this is used to great effect in The Secrets of Nim. And yet again, the scene demonstrates that the true magic lies in the collaboration of both music and colour. In terms of worldviews and perspectives, it might seem a bit odd to be talking about colour and music. After all, the original question was what lessons did animation teach us? Well, all this colour and music made an immense impression on me amidst a complex set of ideas and a narrative that I didn't really get. It was how these built a dark atmosphere that felt palatable, real, with genuine stakes. Stakes established through style, not just content. In paraphrasing Jacob Chesterton, Neil Gaiman wrote, fairy tales are more than true. 
Not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. It's all well and good having dragons in a children's story. But in animation and film in general, the construction, the form and style of it is essential in making its teeth feel like they could dig into you, its claws grab at you, and its fire burn you. To face such a dragon and then come out the other end with a hero victorious and good prevailing is an essential lesson. If only a sanitized dragon can be defeated, what do you do when you're faced with the real thing? You don't show the darkness, you don't appreciate the light. If it weren't for December, no one would appreciate May. In order for light to be meaningful, it needs to defeat true darkness. Darkness that gets to you, that scares you. And as a child, Don Bluth gave me stories that were filled with December, but ended with May. It was those stories that stuck with me. Those that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. How could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. I have a fundamental belief in a good ending, that in the end, all things end up glorious. But that requires to have heard stories that recognize darkness, a setup that is truly terrifying which makes the payoff all the greater. <laughs>